All right, it's awfully quiet in here. Is everybody awake? I don't see much caffeine out there. Maybe that's the problem. All right, I'm Jesse Phelps. Uh, this is reverse engineering a Bluetooth light bulb. So I'm an agile engineering coach at a company called Express Scripts, which is a big company in the US. And uh, in that role, I try to get teams to think about feedback loops and a lot of these things like that we probably all take for granted, surprisingly, of, of testing and uh, you know, red, green, refactor. There are a lot of engineers that still don't get it and are many steps behind on some of this. So I'm trying to help coach teams on how to do these things and talk about feedback loops, trying to get them to have a more dynamic, interactive team, and try to get them to have some fun. And in that process, I was thinking about uh, a build light would be a great thing to have and to have the teams build them and, and you know, put it all together themselves uh, as kind of a team building exercise. Now, build lights are not a new thing. Uh, does anybody have any build lights now? Just out of curiosity? So companies that have them often put stuff up about them because they are kind of unique and fun. Uh, these are some examples that I just went Googling to see um, you know, what other companies had. And they had these. And the first ones that we started with were just some LEDs hooked up to a microcontroller. And that worked, but it was cumbersome and messy and not as, uh, not as portable and all of that. So I found a light bulb that I liked, which is just a nice, simple Bluetooth light bulb. And uh, it has an app with it, and you can control the color, and uh, there's several other things you can do with it. And so I thought, OK, this will work perfectly. It's just a Bluetooth low energy bulb. I should be able to take that and have that become my build light. Well, I emailed the company. And I said, um, you know, hey, I bought this bulb. I'd like to uh, know what the spec for it is so that I can interact with it myself and have my own, my own code on a microcontroller control it. And they said, we don't provide that. So I said, challenge accepted. <laughs> so got a Bluetooth low energy bulb. I have Team City that's running in a Docker container on here. Uh, I have a Raspberry Pi up here. Um, the Bluetooth bulb, as mentioned, or I guess I should have said we're, it's using Bluetooth low energy, and I have the bulb. Um, we're going to packet sniff the communication between the app and the bulb, and um, then we're going to use Wireshark to inspect that protocol, and then put it all together and actually have this operate as a build light. So first thing to know about Bluetooth low energy, um, has anybody done any implementation work with Bluetooth low energy? All right. I'm going to ask us several questions along the way, because I just like to survey and see what people are doing, too. Uh, so basically, the simplest thing you need to know about it is it operates in a key value pair kind of way. And it's called generic attribute. Uh, this generic attribute protocol is what's used. Um, and it's just real simple key values. There are a few other modes of operation. You can actually access the, uh, the logical link as well and do more advanced things, but this is what most Bluetooth low energy devices that you're going to encounter are doing is just generic attribute. So Team City, how many Team City users do we have? All right, less than half. Uh, Jenkins? Anybody have something else? Okay, uh, just curious. Um, so build system, again, I'm running it in Docker. The plugin that I'm using to actually allow this to communicate back to the Raspberry Pi is this Webhooks plugin. And um, what we're doing with that is essentially just grabbing these three lines out of the call that it makes to the, um, to the Raspberry Pi that indicates the project that built and what the status was um, on that in terms of success or fail, and whether it has started or is finished. So that's all I'm extracting from that payload. So then Raspberry Pi, how many Pi owners do we have? All right, we can skip this slide. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm using BlueZ, which is the, um, uh, the Linux, the official Bluetooth support for Linux. How many people have done something with BlueZ? OK, just a couple. So um, for the Raspberry Pi, I haven't found a pre-built binary, so I had to build from source. Uh, anybody of you couple build source yourself as well? OK, so I see nods. Um, Adafruit has a pretty good tutorial on that whole process. If you just search for Blue Z Raspberry Pi, I think it's the first or second link. Um, other devices you may have them built in. Uh, you may be able to find pre-built binaries, so your mileage may vary. So then Bluetooth bulb, I bought this from bluetoothlightbulb.com. Um, in theory, the same process should work with any of them. Um, you know, Philips Hue is really big and popular, uh, so I think it should same process should work. So to actually get the initial round of data, um, I'm using 
uh, an Android device, and you can actually set Android OS to log all of the Bluetooth traffic to a log file. So every manufacturer has it someplace hidden differently, but what you're looking for is this enable Bluetooth HCI snoop. And where it's going to store that log file also changes manufacturer to manufacturer. The one I was using, it was on the SD card. So again, just one of those things you'll have to figure out how to do on your own, but this is a really easy way to actually get a hold of all of that traffic. And I'll come back to how you do it if you don't have that later. Wireshark users. Okay, so for those who haven't used it, it's like Fiddler, lets you inspect traffic, and um, it'll, it'll also parse apart the actual traffic, the, the actual packets, and give you the various blocks and segments of it very nice and easy. Uh, so it's, it's easy to, to uh, analyze a protocol and, um, you know, with, with Wireshark. Lots of options in there too. So then putting it all together, I have a node server that's running on the Raspberry Pi, and I have a React web interface for it, although it's a pretty meaningless web interface, but it's there. Um, Team City webhooks to notify the Raspberry Pi. Noble is the name of the NPM package that will facilitate all of the um, node, Bluetooth, low energy communication for you. And then um, that's actually what sends off the signal to the bulb to uh, change the color of the light for build status information. All right, so let's do this. So the first step here, I'm going to put this bulb in. All right, try not to blind anybody. Can everybody basically see the color of the bulb here? Turn this off real quick. So, as I mentioned, there's an app for this bulb. And whenever you're gonna to try to reverse engineer something like this, what you want to do is try to produce patterns so that something becomes recognizable potentially in the data. And so I've got the app connected to the bulb now. And I'm actually doing this on an iPhone because that's what I use. I just use somebody else's Android to, to do this, but it'll all still uh, you know, fit together fine. So, Basically, I connect to the bulb and I just cycled through some colors and you know, log that data, uh, turn it on and off a few times. There are also these functions that it has in here and I can set it on this you know, pulsating blue and yellow, these various colors. So that's what I did. Just went through and just toggled in these options a few times and uh, just try to produce something that might, I can identify that AB pattern or with the colors, something else uh, in, in this log data. So magically now I have moved that log file over to Wireshark here. Okay. So is that, everybody able to see this okay? In the back, can I get a nod? All right. So I don't know what, I knew nothing about how Bluetooth worked at the time. I just you know, knew I could get these packets and I brought them over here and uh, I went off and I started reading the spec and I was trying to figure out how does this stuff even work. And I'm looking through this data and I had only seen this thing about this generic attribute profile. So as I'm looking through this data, I'm scrolling along and I start to see this GATT show up in here, right? And this is all the magic of Wireshark, recognizing these packets and their descriptors and being able to label them for me in a way that I can try to correlate them with that spec. Um, so I find these in here and just trying to kind of look at them and see what do I, what can I recognize here as any sort of patterns with things. And in, and correlating the time of what I did, it felt like all that stuff was probably initial connection work of getting the bulb um, you know, connected to the app. But as I get further down into here, and I start doing more things, now I start to see this write command in here, and I see this same address over and over. And um, when I look at the value down here, I see it's alternating. Well, I recall turning the power on and off a bunch of times, uh, and when I correlate this with the order that I actually did these things in, that's what that felt like, was maybe this is turning it on and off. So then I had to figure out, now how do I actually test these things like uniquely and individually? And with Blue Z, it turns out, you can interact with um, 
with Bluetooth devices, just like from the command line, there's a CLI utility that you can use to issue commands and, and experiment with things. So I'll show you a couple of things you have to do here. This Bluetooth CTL is uh, an application that lets you like, listen to the Bluetooth traffic around you. It's listening for the advertising. It also lets you control um, whether the Bluetooth is on or off on the device. So I've got this, what you're seeing here is my VNC session running to the Raspberry Pi, by the way. I have uh, a network adapter up here, and so that's what I'm, you're looking at. So this is connected, and what I need to get from here, actually, is I'm gonna run this scan. So you'll see this is all of the advertising Bluetooth devices, probably mostly in this room. And I already have this paired with the bulb, so it's not showing up in that list. But what I had to find is the device ID. And the bulb actually broadcasts its own identifier as LED blue. So I was able to just find the ID. Yes? Ah, yes, sorry. Um, maybe. Better? Okay. Thank you. Point it out if I, if I miss anything else, please. Uh, all right, so I found this LED blue in here, and I gotta scroll to it again. And I was able to get its device ID, which is this here. So there's this application that comes with the Bluezy um, Bluetooth stack that you can use called GAT Tool. And again, you had to build all this from source, but it's there. So I'm gonna run this in the interactive mode, and the ID of the device That's the, uh, the address for the bulb. So this is how I actually tell it. I want to be interactive, and I want to connect to that device. Or well, actually, it's not connected yet. It's, it's uh, preparing to communicate with that address, but it's not connected yet. To connect it, you have to actually tell it to connect. And now it has successfully connected to the bulb. So now the Raspberry Pi has the CLI utility running and talking to the bulb. And through looking at documentation on GAT tool and how do I possibly do this. What I'm experimenting with is a command line here that's uh, char write cmd. And in looking at how the, the spec for this works, all that you're doing is you're sending out uh, to a particular address and then you have the, and that's your key, and then the value that you want to go to the address. And there's char write rec, which for some devices you write something and then it will respond back. And in other cases, you're going to have things like this where you just fire and forget. And um, you know, if you find specs for devices that you're looking at, which is pretty hard it seems in many cases, uh, it, you'll have better documentation that tells you what that is, but this is just experimenting and figuring out what am I looking for here. So, so I'm expecting that if I write this out, something's gonna happen. So let's go, we'll jump back over to uh, Wireshark here. So I see this 0043 is the handle. So I just type that in and I don't know what's gonna happen, but I just, you know, seeing what, it, what happens if I fire one of these packets off myself? And CC2333. All right, so first time, let's see what happens. Nothing happened. Well, if this is the on off, maybe that was the on, right? So let's switch over to the other one here, which is 2433. Three. Bulb went off. That is so exciting every time I press the key and the bulb <laughs> changes. So now let's try the other one again and see if it turns back on. There we go. So it's still doing the same thing it was before when I set it with the app, but uh, you know, it, it's just the on off is different than the what is the bulb doing, right? Wasn't the app connected to the bulb? So can you have multiple no, I shut the app off when I, when I put the phone down. Yeah, so it sends the signal to tell the bulb to turn into that mode, and the bulb is there now. It's not a continuous stream of, of updating the color. All right, so now let's go back over to Wireshark, and let's go dig some more and see what else we can find. So these all look like on-off type of things. But when I get here, I see something entirely new. Let's take this and see what happens. So I can copy that value, because I don't want to type that. 
And it was the same handle, I believe, correct? Yes, yeah. So now, hang on, it doesn't paste across here very well sometimes. Copy value. Oh, and you gotta drop the colons out of, um, of this. All right, so let's send that and see what happens. All right, we got a new color. Let's go look through some of these further here. So I see the same thing going on all these. Keep digging down in here. Okay, now I start to see some changes happening in here. Let's take another one of these and see, see what happens if I grab this. Didn't like my pasting. Paste, what is the deal? Copy, I did click copy value before, right? <laughs> All right, so let's see what this one does. Well, I don't notice that anything changed. No, it's slightly different. See, slightly different in here. Did it? Okay. Let's go grab another one and see. All right, this has a nine in it, which isn't in the other one, so we'll see if we get something. All right, copy. I did, didn't I? Yes, that's what I wanted. Paste, okay. All right, so let's see what happens here. Still only a slight color change. Let's see if we can find something that looks much different. I could also just cheat and go to the end because you know I know the answer. All right, we'll go with this one, and if this doesn't get us enough of a color difference, then I'll just go to the solution guide. <coughs> there we go, now I've got something that looks a little different. So, but as I look at this, and I see, you know, I've done a few different things, I got some different colors. Well, most of this looks exactly the same. I really only see six characters in here that are changing. And uh, you know, if anybody's done color codes before, you might recognize RGB are gonna represent themselves as six hex digits, right? So what if I just take that and I say, perhaps FF0000 will be red, and maybe 00FF00 will be blue, or green, I mean and this will be blue. So now we have successfully reverse engineered the protocol for how we actually change the colors on this bulb. And there, there were other things in here too, because I did that um, uh, where I set it to that pulsating mode of, of yellow and stuff, right? Um, I'm probably not gonna find those. As you can see, this log file was quite lengthy. Um, it's very noisy. But I, I hunted them down once before, so I already have that in my answer key uh, as well. But as you dig through here, you'll see an entirely different packet structure, right? It's not five, six, and then all of that, it's entirely different value. Um, so we've got that part figured out now. And I'll go back to my VNC. All right, I'm gonna disconnect. Okay. Any questions about any of that so far? Yes? You said at the beginning that the bulb was already paired to the Raspberry Pi, is that? I already paired it earlier, so it doesn't show in the discovery list because it already knew it and was already paired to it. How, how do you accomplish the pairing? Um, in the Bluetooth CTL, which is a different CLI utility than what I was just using. I was just using GAT tool, yeah. but in Bluetooth CTL, you actually just say pair and then the device ID. 
it doesn't do anything special. All that happens is that that Bluetooth CTL application, if I tell it to send a command, it will just know exactly what to send it to. That's it. And I didn't unpair it. And the key thing there is that it keeps that information. And the reason why I do that is because in some environments, this one wasn't too noisy, right? Like I ran the scan and it only showed basically one page. I've had some places before where I've done this and it's actually crashed the Pi because it was overloaded with too much data and it was trying, you know, the scrolling just couldn't keep up. It was, it was a bad deal. So that's why I do it that way. That way I know exactly what the ID is. But it can remain sort of paired to your phone. Is it, I know you close the app, but it doesn't matter that you've got that pairing. So the bulb itself, what happens is when you first turn on the bulb, it has like a five to 10 second window where it will listen to um, connect, where it's in discovery mode and it's broadcasting its availability and it will allow whatever the first thing that connects to it, it'll allow it to connect. And uh, connecting is different than pairing, which is also important. Connecting is just, I'm now, I'm now telling you I'm gonna send you commands. Pairing is uh, telling the host, which is the Raspberry Pi, to maintain that affinity, right? Remember it, and in the future, if, if I run Bluetooth CTL and it shows up, it's already in its known history, and it will just immediately grab it. So that's the subtle distinction there. But the bulb will only allow one controller at a time. So I had to actually close the app here so that it would release it before I then could to come back over here and start that for it to pick it up. Does that make sense? Anything else? Yeah. Um, you mentioned you use, uh, when you started, you didn't have any prior knowledge of how to connect to this uh, Raspberry Pi and all that stuff. How long did it take roughly to get to this point? Get to this point? Um, this was probably two to three weeks of off and on messing around with it. And, um, and I didn't even know that Bluetooth Low Energy had this as its underlying thing. So I had a Bluetooth Low Energy serial adapter as well. And that serial adapter would see the bulb. I spent probably three or four days of that time thinking that maybe the serial protocol is all that BLE does. This is before I bothered to go read the spec, right? Uh, and I'm trying to get the serial, um, the serial link to connect to the bulb. And it would connect, but I could never do anything, right? And um, so that, that was kind of a dead end, right? I went down a couple of those dead ends before I finally got to the point where it was, okay, let me go look through this you know, 400 page spec for Bluetooth and see what nuggets I can find that I can go then Google and find something else, right? So, all in all, this, was, this whole thing was probably about a month of off and on work. So the Raspberry Pi itself doesn't have Bluetooth when you, you need to, an adapter? No, the Raspberry Pi 3 has Bluetooth built on. Right. Okay. Yep, it's got Wi-Fi. So all you needed was the Raspberry Pi, you didn't need any extra hardware. Correct, yes, yeah. And, and honestly, the, the original incarnation of this was not with a Raspberry Pi, it was with an Intel Edison. Uh, but the Intel Edison has been discontinued, so I ported it all over the Raspberry Pi, and so that's where we are. It is a lot easier um, to use the Raspberry Pi than it is to use an Intel Edison, because an, an Edison is just a microcontroller, basically. This is actually a full functioning computer. Now the downside is I had to have this network adapter and VNC into it, because I can't just have some other you know, connection and send serial terminal, right? So, did I see another hand? Okay. All right, so. Now we've got all that working. Let's jump over to Team City here real quick. And go to my browser. All right, so Team City, I just have one dummy build out here. Um, as I said, I'm running this in Docker, and I've got, there, there are actually two separate instances running on here. How many Docker users do we have? Okay, so I'm gonna probably gloss over Docker then, uh, or skip it. So uh, I have, Team City server, which is a separate instance or separate container from the agent. On Jenkins, they're actually all together in one if you're just doing it in a, a, a standard um, install with Jenkins on here. So server's running, agent's running, and then as I mentioned, that webhook plugin. So you install that plugin, which is just download the zip and upload it in from the web interface, and that's it. And then this is set up to have all builds and um, I'm using the Bonjour protocol here, so I can just plug things in and it magically works. And, uh, and it's the dot .local extension on here then. Is it, anybody familiar with that? Uh, so basically on a Mac at least, it's built in, and Raspberry Pi and a handful of other, uh, like 
printers will often do it as well. And they just sort of auto recognize each other. Like I don't have to deal with the IP addresses or anything. I don't have any DHCP running on here. You just plug it in and, and it works. So you just have to know what it's calling itself. That's it. And to do that, you do ARP. So if you do, go to the, I'll show you real quick because it's actually kind of fun. So if you do this ARP on here, um, shouldn't show up in that list. What's that? Uh, well, it's not, in, I'm not seeing it at the moment, so uh, that may not be helpful. All right, I don't know why it's not showing up, but it, that's not the point of this talk, so forget I said that. <clears throat> but that's usually what you do. You do the, get the ARP list, and then it'll tell you the name that the thing is broadcasting itself as. So, uh, okay, so let's jump back over here. And so you've seen the team, team City set up, and it's just gonna send that webhook call off to raspberrypi.local, and that's all hooked up here. And then let's take a look at some of this code in Team City. So, and this is sloppy, hacky, you know, toy, right? So, so how, that's how this is sometimes. So we get this set up in here, and as I mentioned, Noble is, I'll show you the package list. All right, so Noble is the, I'll increase the size. Okay, it, it was working just very slowly. Is that good enough in the back? Okay. Is that still good enough? All right, I'm gonna go down one so that this is navigable. Maybe. Is that a five, two, or three? This is a three, B. <coughs> All right, Noble is the package that you need to do the Bluetooth communication, and it just wraps and encapsulates things nice and easily for you. And then I've got Express running on here for web server. And then I also have socket IO on here. Um, and I'm basically using that so that I could simplify some of the work of when a bulb connects and I'm keeping track of the list of known bulbs and I want to send that off to the client. I didn't want to deal with writing a REST interface to all of that. So I just threw socket in there and just throw over the list. So just a little easier. So let's go look at the code here on the server now. All right, so this gets set up and important things along the way. Let me run this and I'll have the bulb connect to it because the bulb is blue right now. You do have to run this as root to access um, the Bluetooth device through Noble. I suppose you don't have to. I'm sure that I could spend the work of figuring out what exact permission settings need to be to make it work, but that's more work than it's worth. All right, so what should happen is this should come up and, okay, so the bulb was, because nothing was connected to it, it was still broadcasting its discovery packet and the, uh, the web server here through Noble, caught the packet and immediately grabbed a hold of the bulb. And what I had it do uh, when it first connects is set the bulb to green, just so that I had a visual indicator that things are working, right? So that's what happened here. Okay, so let's talk through how some of this works. I'm gonna close this uh, window on the left here, if I can figure out what that thing's called. First, oh, yes, that's right, thank you. Okay. So let's scroll down through here. There's discover. All right, so there's a wire up method that I have called set up bulb stuff. And uh, basically, you know, naming things is hard, right? And all this is essentially an async wrapper so that I can make awaits on the things that needed to happen to actually have this work, so. Uh, so the discover, so I'm doing noble on the discover event go you know, use this discover method. State change, so there are, there are some idiosyncrasies you're gonna run into with every platform and device you use. On the Raspberry Pi, the state change method actually never gets fired because it's always in scanning uh, when, when I start this up. But on the Intel Edison, 
it wasn't in scanning. It would be in powered on would be its state. So when this would start up, I would need it to actually uh, set up the state change method, which it then would be signaled powered on as the state, and then I actually had to tell it to do, to do the start scanning before discoveries could occur. So there are probably going to be other idiosyncrasies with every platform that you run into out there, um, but this code all works on the Pi 3b at least. <laughs> So that discovery method, let's go to it, which was right up here. So when this gets discovered, you'll see what, what happens with that discovery method is everything that's broadcasting is discovered. So all of your smartwatches that you've got on right now or Fitbits or you know, anything in this room, the things that you saw in that list when I said scan on, it's picking all those up. But obviously, they're not all Bluetooth bulbs. So the only thing I could find as a good indicator was in the name of the device that starts with LED blue. So I'm just looking for the string. And if it says it's an LED blue, then I want to grab it and connect to it. And as soon as it connects, I have it right out that it discovered the bulb of the console. But my console is actually off the screen because of sizing and projectors and things that you think we would have figured out by now. Uh, so I connect to that bulb. And now I've got it. And We'll go to the send command method in just a minute. Um, but I sent the command with the color green so that the bulb turns green and I can identify it. And then on each individual peripheral, you have states and events that you can manage and, and set up. And so I set up the, dis the disconnect method or uh, event on there so that any time a bulb disconnects, uh, it'll actually tell me right that of the console. And I don't know if it's I'm doing something dumb or or, or if it's a crappy manufactured bulb, but it disconnects a lot for no reason. And um, so what you'll also see in a minute is in my send command, uh, the very first thing I do is if it's not connected, connect it, and then send the command. <laughs> uh, and it works, you know. But I think that it's just noisy, right? Like, uh, you know, when we're in, I'm at my house and everything's running on 2.4 gigahertz and, uh, you know, conferences and you're all wearing devices, I think there's just a lot of noise and uh, the Bluetooth low energy, by definition, is low energy. So I think it just gets interfered with easily and disconnects. All right, so send command. So we already saw that we were writing out to that handle. And I'm writing out whatever I pass in from that when I make the send command call, just whatever that buffer uh, hex address is. Now, what you'll notice in here is that I have a different handle on this one. And that's because um, we bought multiple of these and had them all running off of one Raspberry Pi. And what I discovered was that the, you saw this was LED blue dash seven and then other digits, right? Well, if it's dash eight, it's a different handle. So, and again, I don't know how to find any sort of other identifying characteristics to tell me like what handle I should use. So this was just trial and error and I figured that out. So I just stuck that in here. That's my logic identifier. If it's a dash seven on the address, we use four three. If it's dash eight, we use two E as the address to write to. But everything else is exactly the same. And that just comes off of the, uh, this peripheral, that discovery broadcast is, the, is called an advertisement and it's the local name off of that advertisement. Once the, <clears throat> why wouldn't you use the, uh, the microstyle addresses for that? Right? If you know those like, set of hex that are they not different between bulbs? So why wouldn't you, if you've already connected to them want to stick together with the information, why wouldn't you just use the? Oh, I understand. Because then I would have to catalog that list, right? I'd have to have a lookup table. And, and um, I was looking for something that was one abstraction away from that, so that if we just bought another bulb and hooked it up, hopefully it would be able to classify it based on that identifier. And I don't know, this, this abstraction could be wrong, right? I could get another bulb and it's seven zero, and it doesn't follow the same rules as the other sevens that we had. Um, but that was just the one common element that I could find uh, between the ones that worked was that first digit was a seven versus an eight. And you know the company was just so helpful at telling me anything at all. So it was all just guesswork. All right, so I think that's basically the stuff that's important in here. Um, 
on the client side, let's go take a look at that. Actually, let's just go to the web page and run this so we can see what's happening here. So this is all I have on here, nothing fancy. And all I was able to do was just write out, or all I was doing was writing out the rest of that name of the bulb. And then the problem is there's nothing on the bulb itself that actually tells me what its Bluetooth identity would be or anything like that. So I added this identify function on here so that it just causes it to cycle through colors, which to kind of address the thing we were talking about earlier, I'm not sending a stream of colors. That is just one of the methods that the bulb had, and I'll show you what that is, the, the, the hex values for that. Um, but you can change it to just like seven color cycle, right? And there's one command you issue, and then it does that. And then I have a timeout that gets set, and at the end of that two or three seconds or whatever, it just reverts back to green. So that, we added that in there so we could actually identify which bulb was which. And then um, I'm using the Team City APIs to get the list of build projects, and I can pick the ones I want and then assign them together. And now, they're, now they have a relationship. Um, and I have a config file that all this stuff can be put in ahead of time as well, although that is essentially a lookup table then. Um, but uh, that way we could have it just out of, uh, when it boots up, pick it up and, and use that. So now let's go to Team City and let's see it all happen. Are you ready? All right, so all that I have this build doing is sleeping for 10 seconds. That's just a command line. Sleep for 10 seconds, and if I want it to pass, I have it not echo fail, and if I want it to fail, I echo fail. So should we do fail first? All right, you know, we've got to do red green, right? So I'm going to kick this build off. Now, one thing I want you to notice is watch the difference between the display and the bulb in terms of the sequencing and timing. I just clicked run. So pulsing blue is the running status. And we've get, we hit fail. So what this this information here told me is that the agent is what actually is sending the commands to, uh, to Team City from that webhook plugin. And when I went and checked their, doc their, their uh, documentation with their code, that's what I found in there as well. So there, it's just interesting the lag between the UI update, right, and the bulb. The bulb is more accurate than the UI. And at this point, when it goes red, what do you say? <coughs> Who broke the build? All right, now we'll go back in and go green. That's the team building part of this. You get to chastise each other a little bit. And, you know. All right, here we go. Now we're green. You can clap, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so same stuff should work with Jenkins. There's a Jenkins notification plugin. Uh, I've started setting it up, but I don't use Jenkins. I just want to use Team City, and I haven't been motivated enough to finish it, so it's there. Someone finish it and issue a pull request to me, and I'll bring in your code. Uh, but this is basically what you need. <coughs> The, the, real, the real hiccup or goofy part here is uh, with the way that Jenkins cascades all the jobs in the API call, um, you got to flatten it all out, and I just didn't want to do all the work of it, and I didn't want to bring in Lodash either, so it's a whole deal. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I pulled this log from an Android device, but I don't use an Android device. I use an iPhone. So what am I going to do other than borrow one from somebody if I need to capture traffic here, or what if I want to capture traffic between devices that don't actually have a, an interface of some kind, an app for me anyway, if it's just devices that are talking to each other and doing something, and I want to get in between there and make my own things happen my own way. Well, that's when we go to hard mode. And hard mode is using, oh, interesting, that should say Ubertooth. I'm not sure why it doesn't. This is an Ubertooth. 
No, that says hard mode. And then, like an hour ago, that said Ubertooth. So, <laughs> but this is an Ubertooth. And what an Ubertooth is, is uh, you'll notice not Bluetooth in the name, right? Well, that's because to call yourself or call a device Bluetooth, uh, you have to go through a certification and compliance process, and, or else they sue you for copyright infringement. That's how they enforce the, that you follow their spec if you're going to call yourself that. But an Ubertooth is not Bluetooth, and it ignores one key important part of the spec on purpose. And that is that Bluetooth devices are in the chip itself not supposed to pass on traffic that is not intended for their address. So the traffic in the air that's going between your devices, my phone hearing it, and the chip itself says, not for me, and does not send it on to the OS and the software. The Ubertooth says, I'm going to just take everything. So you can capture the traffic between the iPhone app and the light bulb on a side snoop, right? So, so yeah. like Wireshark in promiscuous mode. What's that? Is that like Wireshark uh, in promiscuous mode? Where it's listening yes, to exactly, yeah. But so Wireshark in promiscuous mode can only operate that way if your network infrastructure actually allows that, right? Your, it, Wireshark is just, listen, and so is your OS. Everything on your machine, any packet that comes in your physical link, your OS is picking up in some fashion. But in most networks, especially if you have like a regulated environment, I work in a healthcare environment, and so we have everything locked down to where not a single packet is ever gonna show up at your port that the network infrastructure has not determined is actually destined for your MAC address, right? So that's the subtle difference in there. All right, so let's hook this up. I'm gonna go ahead and unplug the, uh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna unplug it. I only have two USB ports on here, so. All right, so I have the Ubertooth plugged in. Now, the way that you use this, so again, you gotta build from source, because, um, in fact, I actually even wondered, I'm not gonna say the, I'm not gonna say the rest of this. You, they can't legally distribute the binary. That's the thing, right? There are a number of, um, there are a number of software things, like, uh, like PGP, I think, as well. They can't legally allow a binary of, of PGP to move from the border of one country to another because of treaties between all these countries. So if you're gonna use PGP, you actually have to build it from source uh, if most of the time for that kind of reason. That's why, so all those weird things. Ubertooth, you have to build from source for that same reason. The source code is protected by, at least in the US First Amendment, and many other countries have similar things that protect it, but the binaries themselves, you, you can't distribute legally, so. So you get this, and then now you have to go to Wireshark. We have to change things up a bit. Um, first thing you gotta do, so Ubertooth is hooked up um, on Linux-based OS, and Mac is BSD based, the so same thing. Uh, you can just make a generic file handle that acts as a first in, first out buffer. And so if you do make FIFO, you can specify any file that you want. And this actually just gives you a handle on the OS, a, a, a device description um, that you write data into. And anything else that's captured it and listening will get that data back out. Okay, so it's just a first in, first out buffer. So make FIFO temp pipe is what I've got on here. I've already done that, and, it, and that pipe will, will persist as well, so it's already there. So now I can come to Wireshark, and you have to go to manage interfaces and pipes, and then you tell it the path to that named pipe, right? So temp pipe is in there. And then now I'm gonna pick that pipe. All right, so it's now, Wireshark is now listening to that device handle and it's just gonna capture whatever comes through. So now I can come over to, and I wrote, uh, wrote it down ahead of time over here. So now I can execute, I didn't hit the Mac copy, I hit the Linux copy. I have to keep changing back and forth. Okay, so that, that wrote and already had the enter on there, so it immediately started. And this is all of the traffic happening in here right now. And it's just writing out to that buffer and um, 
and it's getting passed over to Wireshark. So Wireshark is just capturing everything, right? So go ahead and uh, you know use your banking apps and buy things, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? All right, so I'm gonna stop that. Now, as you see, the traffic here is immense, right? And it's, it's gonna be uh, useless to sort through. So I have a capture that I did at home where I had low traffic and I'll switch to that in just a second. But I wanna talk about this just for a moment more. Uh, when you capture this, the way Bluetooth Low Energy does that whole discovery, advertising, and, um, and, uh, and connecting process, there are three different channels that it broadcasts that dis uh, advertisement on. Then when, and you discover from, then when a connect occurs and the host issues a connect command, they jump to a different um, frequency. So there are three address, three, three radio frequencies that it uses, and then it'll jump to one of like 16, I think, um, that it actually has that active communication on. So what this is, this is defaulting to like address 37, and you have 38 and 39 that are also um, advertising addresses. Uh, so this is just picking up the advertisements from 37 when, you, when I first run it. I can tell it to do 38 or 39, but you can only do one at a time on an Ubertooth. Then what happens is as soon as it observes a connect command occur, it, it follows that. That's, um, I think it was in the command over here, the dash F on there, that tells it to follow a connect. So it's listening for whatever's happening on 37. As soon as it sees a connect, it observes what address they have agreed to move to, and it will follow them to that address, and now it can capture all the traffic between them. So probably what we see here is either all advertisements, which I see lots of things that say broadcast, so probably all advertisements, um, but it could have also had it could have observed a connect and followed, and then this is the actual traffic over the air between them. Now, this isn't just Bluetooth Low Energy. This is Bluetooth, period. Uh, so blow Bluetooth Low Energy has no encryption standards that are baked in. You kind of got to write your own. Bluetooth does. So what you'll get in here, if you're actually capturing um, Bluetooth traffic in general between uh, you know, a lot of devices, it will be encrypted traffic. Uh, of course, people have written the software to decrypt it and hack it and figure it all out, right? So that's out there too. Um, but anyway, just giving you that, if you get this and you're listening and you're having problems, go check uh, into the how do I change the address that it listens on discovery and how do I get it to follow? Because that's the stuff that you gotta mess with. So I'll switch over here real quick to this Uber PCAP file is what this one is. If I can get it to... Stop trying to rename the file and, okay. So this is the traffic that I captured from home where it was a nice quiet environment and picked up the communication on um, writing to this bulb. And you'll see, if I come down in here further, we see these same write commands again, right? And this was captured with my iPhone talking directly to the bulb and an Ubertooth just listening on the side, not involved in the communication at all, and just pick up what's happening and you can reverse engineer that protocol from that. So, any questions about that? Any questions about any of this? Yes? Did you look at instead of just wrapping the replacement padding to the composite? One more time? Did you have instead of wrapping the AP padding command for the other side? Ah, I did actually. That was one of the first dead end, or the, the dead ends I went down. So uh, the APK that this company put out for um, for the app is obfuscated. So I was able to get it to uh, I was able to get it into Java, but everything was such a mess I couldn't make heads or tails of it because it was all just um, it, you know it was all obfuscated. I had no naming for anything. It, it was just terrible to try to reverse. I'm not a Java developer. I'm a .NET and JavaScript guy. So perhaps if you're better with Java and know the JVM better and all that stuff, it might be more manageable for somebody, but that's not my expertise. Yes? So this is a Bluetooth example, but could you do a Wi-Fi So, I mean, in principle, yes. All the same stuff would work. Uh, I don't have the answer for how do you go about capturing that traffic, right? Like, but I guarantee you, if you spend 10 minutes on Google, you'll find some device that somebody has out there 
that is designed to let you do things you're not supposed to do and capture all of the traffic from Wi-Fi. And they probably don't call it you know, Wi-Fi because that's copyright protected by IEEE. They probably call it like SpyFi or something. I'm just making this up. Uh, but <laughs> anything else? Do you want to see it again? <laughs> I'll hook up the, uh, gotta, this is why I didn't unplug the power on there. Network, there we go. <coughs> All right, here we go. Hopefully everything magically restored itself when I unplugged it and plugged it back in. It didn't. Oh, you know what? I didn't start the web server again, did I? because I stopped it a minute ago. Actually, it could have been that that caught the bulb in the advertising uh, and have to relink it. Okay, there we go. Bold connected. What is happening? All right, we'll forget that last demo. We'll pretend it wasn't. <laughs> All right, well, uh, if you have any questions, you can come and talk to me. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Have a good one. Yes, it is. Uh, I guess I, the last slide I'll throw up there real fast. Uh, it's on GitHub, my code, build light. Jesse Phelps slash build light. Um, how much